spatial mapping will continue to be one of the hot items around blockchain and of course some of the big companies that are starting to move in this space we want to define for you and maybe give you an outlook going forward i think you guys will like this one my name is paul bear welcome back into tech path i want to thank our sponsor today and that is tangem if you're looking at going into self-custody and maybe this is the first time that you've started to do self-custody well jump over to tangem.com you can start your journey over there by just getting one of their wallets which is a card it works in conjunction with their app, super secure and very easy to set up. All you have to do is just visit uh, tangible.com. Make sure and use our code down below for an additional discount. All right, so let's get into it today. We will have a special guest joining us today and really talking about where blockchain is going. And there's a handful of projects that because of what we've seen with advancement in technology, primarily from some of the giants, some of these projects are starting to get challenged. And I think this is a good, a good outline to get to. Remember that we did a tweet not too long ago, and it was talking about the spatial mapping explosion. Now, some of the ones that you see in here is Hive Mapper, Affin, uh, et cetera, and then of course, Over, which is who's gonna be on the show today talking about this. And the reason we wanna break this down is because there's a lot happening in this area. And spatial mapping, is getting ready to see an explosion of use case, possibly by some of the biggest companies out there. And I wanna to go to uh, a recap of what happened at AWE, just to kind of give you guys a framework of this and why it matters to blockchain. Take a look. Photorealistic, stunning detail, and you can now scan, process on device. So it's a game changer. And yesterday we launched Niantic Studio. Niantic Studio is a visual editor and a major evolution over the 8th Wall Code Editor. Hello Dot is a mixed reality experience based off of Peridot, where you have the kind of magic of interacting with a magical creature in your very own space. We created this demo based on Niantic Lightship. Multiple people seeing the same thing at the same time, cross platform. You gotta build for the future. We're only getting started. All right, so in case you're not aware, Niantic, one of the behemoths backed by Google, Hive Mapper was the other one, uh, one of the other projects that we thought, well, okay, this could be another opportunity. And remember, Hive Mapper is mapping roads and thoroughways, et cetera. But they did have a little bit of a setback here recently. So they're trying to get into some major fleet platforms, which is going to slow down their B dash cam capability. And that is a big deal with the product release scheduled to be adjusted slightly, which simply means I think is code for probably not this year. Now, granted, I'd love to hear from Ariel if that is not the case, but the B-dash cam is a pretty big device because it could open it up to a lot of people. And I think that's a big hit for what we'll see with Hive Mapper. One of the companies that we have been following for a while that we really liked kind of changed my position on them over this interview right here. I want to show you a clip from it. Let's take a look. So Niantic, it's the company behind Pokemon Go. You know, very luckily, we actually had a had a chat with them. I wanted to you know have a chat with them, see if there's a chance of, for collaboration. One thing I really learned about right was we completely uh, and utterly underestimated how much resources and how long it would take to actually develop Nexus work. Wow, okay, this was way, way off our, what we expected. It was quite scary, lah, right? Oh, shit, what, what can we do, right? I need, for me, a reality check, lah, right? Because the fact is we may not have enough money to build Nexus world until the end state. Now, even if we get Nexus, somehow we get Nexus world to the very, very end state, lah, right? We don't have the, the money like them to be able to inject capital to do marketing and drive users into the to the game. So this is bad news for a fin. And it's also, I think, bad news in general for blockchain because what it's showing is that the bigger guys out there have all these resources and they're waking up to what's happening in the industry. Now, one of the last hopes that we've considered is a project called Over. And you've heard us talk about Over the Reality for quite some time. In fact, they were around all the way back into the last bull run. And they were, you know, very active then. A lot of things have happened since then. So we invited their COO to come on the show and I wanna welcome him in. Diego Di Tomas, how are you? Hi everybody, I'm happy to be here. It's amazing, excellent. thank you very much. Excellent. First of all, thanks for coming in today. As you can see, a lot of the market is in a bit of an uproar with what's happening just in the trends, but also the pickup in uh, overall performance, I think, of companies like Niantic. 
If you look at you guys, your map to earn completed scans continuing to, to move up. So your stats so far still growing. I was looking at some more data right here. This is just the experiences side. If some of you guys have not ever checked out over, go over to check it out. It's just marketplace.over.ai and you can start to kind of get a little bit more of an insight. But I want to kind of get the current status, uh, Diego, of over. Where are you guys right now? What's the current status of what you guys are doing? Yeah, no, thanks for that. And, uh, and also thanks for the analysis that you did. That was quite amazing, I have to say. So um, coming to over, so we, we are still pushing very hard, like, like always. And I would say that the main focus in the last months have been the mapping side. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, we reach more than 50,000 maps and we are growing constantly. So we are around 30% per month in terms of map we generate. So now we are around 7,000 maps uh, per month. Actually, when we started uh, with the program in November, we were generating 700 maps per month. So it's an impressive growth and it's still growing. And we had to buy more machines for that. I mean, it's it's kind of tough to, to scale, but I mean, the, the most difficult thing is not really the machines, it's actually to create the right incentive to bring the people to map and to map the important locations. Right. Uh, the reason why we've been uh, fo focusing so much on the mapping side is because we believe that this is really the big differentiator and really what uh, will make a difference between a successful and a not successful XR company. Because our thesis is that at the end of the day, the tooling to actually create the 3D assets, uh, the publishers and so on, yes, is something that is uh, difficult to build, but not impossible to build. Uh, the really precious thing, the really something that is very hard to create is this database of maps of important locations in the world. And these maps, uh, I just go a little bit through that, is what actually enables uh, very compelling AR experiences, so precise AR, both indoor and outdoor. But not only that, uh, what these maps brings is actually also a kind of merge between the AR and VR experience, uh, maybe what some people call XR or spatial computing. So, right. you know, AR is very cool because you can augment physical locations when you are in the location, but there's a problem. The problem is that you cannot access those locations if you're not there. Actually, with this mapping, you actually create a digital twin of the location and you can explore it remotely. So you bring the no locality of AR of VR to AR. And this is a very, very powerful thing. And I think it's a, a paradigm shift um, in really what we define in AR, XR, and spatial computing. So that's why this has been the greatest focus uh, in the last months. How do you guys see being able to compete with someone like a Niantic who's been able to launch Pokemon Go, collect a lot of data out there, pretty much free from mm -hmm. users and somewhat, you know, rabbit in terms of just the amount of people that got into that game from a viral standpoint. Do you feel like you guys would need a strategy similar to that, possibly game partnerships, et cetera? Uh, we believe that uh, generating this data for the maps through uh, a game uh, is not really uh, the best scenario. In fact, if you go and check uh, the maps from Niantic, other than San Francisco and other places, uh, those are not so consistent. And there is a reason why for that, because in our case, when we ask people to map, we ask them to do something with an intention, to actually map, and we have a user interface that is actually focus to, to uh, achieve that kind of goal. Well, if you just uh, take data from casual gamers that are not there to map, uh, the quality of the maps will be inconsistent. So while it's good in terms of numbers, you're going to be able to say, yes, we generate 100,000 maps from people around the world. Uh, the actual quality and the usability of that map will be not so good. So uh, unfortunately, I mean, this uh, activity of mapping locations is kind of... Uh, 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 I would say uh, not super easy activity. It takes three to five minutes. It's not that mm -hmm. much to map a 300 square meters location, but you n really need to have the intention to that. So you need to take pictures from that many different angles and so on. So either you are forced to do that from the user interface, either the quality of the things you generate will be some pictures that are useful, but not really so much. In right. that case, probably it's better to just take pictures from a car. Uh, like, I don't know, Google is doing or I've mapped or others. All right. So, I mean, that gives me a little bit of, uh, of, I think, hope, you know, when you look at some of the projects that are out there, if, if this can get much more detailed. And one of the ways that they've been able to scale is, is maybe attaching to these viral games. I was just looking at, this is Pal World, 
Some of you guys may have seen this. And this is one of the games that made it over to Microsoft and was able to kind of get breakout. Why not say, all right, let's go in and assist some of these game companies that have not maybe gone fully into spatial mapping and assist them with this, with a partnership with Over. Would that work? Absolutely. So, I mean, the, uh, the real vision about Over is really to be uh, a low-level interface. So, uh, the, sorry, uh, in, uh, low-level uh, platform. So the idea is to enable, uh, to actually connect 3D asset to space very precisely. Uh, over over that kind of layer, you can build games. So that's why we have uh, the SDK Unity SDK Builder and the Web Builder right. that are going to release a new version very soon. So uh, basically, to us, I mean, it's just the perfect fit. So to provide uh, the actually components to actually create AR content, just like Niantic is doing at the end of the day, and then allow other people to build on. Actually, Niantic incidentally has started with a game that was a huge success that was Pokemon Go. Mm -hmm. Very difficult sure. to recreate after that, we saw. Uh, but the move that they did later is to become a platform to enable AR content. So basically, we started uh, from that goal that was the goal that uh, Niantic take later. So, I mean, well, okay, so that, that is still, you know, going head-to-head -head with some of the biggest ones out there. I mean, even looking at mm -hmm. Minecraft, uh, they kind of gave up early on the space. This was back, I think, in 2021, but uh, Minecraft Earth came to an end just before MetaQuest and all of the movement I think we saw from mm -hmm. Meta in general about AR, VR, which I think reignited the potential there. And now what we're seeing with the potential of spatial computing, which I think is a big deal, I was also looking at a post that you guys did, and of course, that's uh, you're there with Sebastian, uh, hanging out. <laughs> so, yeah. what what is the uh, alignment with you guys and Sandbox? Well, so I mean, uh, Sebastian is a friend, and I always met around the world at conference. So I always la love to catch up with him and and tell what we're doing and what we're up to. Uh, each one of us. I mean, the the friendship with uh, Sebastian really started when uh, we start collaborating with uh, bringing their assets to the AR to the AR metaverse, okay. what we called before. So the, the powerful thing there is that, again, for the way that the platform is conceived, uh, the platform is built to actually welcome uh, content that is built from other creators. And I right. mean, Sandbox, uh, it's an amazing game and creation. So the, the opportunity to bring outside assets from Sandbox was the first use case. Uh, but we can imagine more. I mean, it's not just, a, I mean, we just started at the beginning with uh, importing characters that you can control in AR, so bring it out from the game and just uh, blending those with reality. Uh, and, and also there was the, there is the component of NFT ownership. So if you own the NFT, you can use it all, not only on Sandbox, but also on Over. But we can go beyond that. We can actually recreate the world games. Uh, actually, their games is built on Unity. So it's not so difficult to export it directly in our platform. It is also built on Unity. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we are we're always open to that. We always have this idea of uh, this, what, when we call it the metaverse, like two years ago or something like that. Yeah. Uh, the idea is that the, the component that Web3 was bringing there was the opportunity to actually merge content, to actually mm -hmm. unlock content from a single platform. Uh, like, for example, you're showcasing now uh, us bringing these assets on over, assets from Sandbox. If I wanted to do it with a Web2 game, uh, first of all, I didn't know, I would not know where to take the asset. And second, if I was able to get the asset, probably they would sue me. So that, that, that's the powerful thing, I think, about the content and what we can build in Web3. The fact that since the ownership of the asset is not really linked to the platform only, but to the users mm -hmm. that actually own these assets, these assets can actually live and by default basically can live in different metaverses. And this is powerful because basically you can combine all the creative capabilities of many, many different people and many, many right. different ways of building games and, and basically cross-pollinate uh, between different platforms. Well, and I think that's an advantage for you guys. I think you're exactly right. That's one of the key things uh, leaping forward. If you, I want to show you a clip because yeah. this shows a little bit to your point that you were talking about earlier where your mapping strategy is quite a bit different than if you get into these, you know, super isolated areas like San Francisco or the Bay Area from a game company that's been able to isolate in on that. This is a clip of Niantic and their idea around creating mega maps. Take a look. 
because we have increased the maximum localization distance from five to 50 meters, uh, which actually means you can start to build experiences that are very large uh, in size. Um, so this like shows like the ferry schedule, um, and then as you're walking, uh, we sort of show and illuminate a path for, as we walk all the way up to the door. And as the person's walking around, we're just sort of overlaying this larger world model that we created. This is like near future. This is not like 2027. This is like later this year. Um, so this is actually a combination of a whole bunch of different data types that we're able to all fuse together and georeference uh, in London. And you can see we can even zoom all the way down and like go around this building and into the building and like have one continuous experience. Uh, so you can imagine how uh, if you wanted to build a game where you're like bird simulator or something, like this could be like a really cool experience in a headset. This is coming, not 2027, this is coming like very soon. Um, in this particular example, it's pulling in data um, that actually requires a lot of work on the server to make this possible, but the, the, pay, the payoff you get for that is like enormous. And importantly, any developer anywhere can add any location uh, and we will activate it for you for free, right now at least. All right, a couple of key notes there. I love that for free right now, uh, but can you keep up with this at the pace in which they're talking about releasing, even if, they, if it were a paid product coming out of you know, Niantic, Google, et cetera? Well, well yeah, yes, you know, of, of course, the point is that the, the, the question is, how will they generate this data? Uh, because mm -hmm. you know, one thing is to uh, basically, for example, doing what uh, Google is doing or iMapper is doing, just uh, putting cameras uh, into cars and going right. around the world. So you, you, in that case, uh, you can get maps of streets. Uh, but what about going uh, inside locations? So, for example, in that villa that we were, we've seen there, you need somebody physically going there. There is no machine that is going to do that. You mm -hmm. need a sure. human being that walking there and taking the pictures. So the question is, how do you incentivize those guys? So, uh, I mean, the, the, the powerful thing, I mean, the, the, the powerful paradigm that is really emerging this year is this deep in movement. So right. we can actually have an army of people uh, that just with a smartphone that everybody already has in his pocket, uh, they can actually get a reward and we can give it directly with cryptocurrencies all around the world. We don't need to ask permit to Visa or to anybody mm -hmm. to make exactly. a micro transaction. And in this way, uh, we can have an army basically everywhere around the world. So. Uh, I mean, we can use that because we have this paradigm. We, we, we were born in Web3. Uh, I'm wondering how they're going to do that. So what, what I think that they are going to release is something that is based on photo streets and on some uh, very, I mean, famous locations, few ones around the right. world uh, yeah. that basically has already been mapped with drones and so on. Uh, but I think that it will be like complementary kind of data uh, because the kind of data that we can generate by having people going around the world and the kind of data that they can have with a more desk, a more centralized fashion, I think will be kind of different and yeah. probably, uh, I mean, congruent data. So probably there will be ways also to collaborate in that direction, uh, even, of well, course, I, if we can see them as a competitor. Right. I, th I think you hit on a couple of really good points. And you've got the right catalyst. One, a, a smartphone, which everybody has, and two the, you know, catalyst of being involved in crypto, which creates that, you know, that potential for, you know, interest. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think in people jumping into this. So I would agree with you. I think that might be a possibility. So how long, when, Diego, when you look at the potential roadmap here, are you thinking that we will see real critical movement in spatial mapping in what, 12 months, 24 months? What, what's your thought right now? Yeah, so it's um, the, the question, uh, if I can translate in my terms, is, I mean, what will be the threshold of number of maps when right. basically we will have a lot of utility from this database that we're generating? So uh, I, I would, there is no perfect answer to that, but I try my best. So uh, in terms of locations that we sold around the world, uh, you know that, uh, I mean, over, maybe you didn't mention, but uh, I, I know you know that, I mean, it was like with selling land. So there is special domains. So like in the web, you have a web domain, like Diego.com, you publish in that place. In over, you have a spatial domain. So you buy a parcel of 300 square meters, you can decide what will be the AR content anchored to that location. So we sold 870,000 of those locations. And right now, uh, if you go in an important location in the world, probably uh, that will be both, at least the center of that. Uh, right. Maybe not all of it, but the center of that. So we can say that 800,000 maps on that locations will probably uh, get you to okay. have mappings that are useful 
for basically anybody. Uh, but probably uh, what we believe is that we can go far below that. And we believe that the number of maps that are, uh, I mean, enough to actually have a very useful product is around 150,000. The reason why for that is what also Niantic was mentioning in the video that we were showing. So one map, actually, uh, if it's in a big location, like, for example, uh, we did an event in Piazza Duomo in Milano. So uh, we was projecting content in the world Piazza Duomo, but for that, we just use one map. Mm -hmm. So one map for an open location is enough to actually activate a very precise AR experiences in all the location. And so uh, if, I mean, we, we are right with the way we incentivize and we keep uh, collecting uh, maps of important locations in the world, we think that when we are around 150,000, it will be very likely that if you want to publish something in an important location, we will have already the data for that. And so that is that is the goal, really. That is what we are we are looking to uh, to achieve as fast as we can. And we believe that we are going to be able to go beyond 100,000 maps by the end of the year, and by the middle of the next year, uh, for sure, uh, being beyond 150,000 locations. Uh, well, that's going to get. It, it, it is, that would be significant. Yeah. That would be significant. I think a lot of companies, even the size of Meta and Google, would probably take notice of something like that. I'm looking at Meta right now. Connect is getting ready to happen here September 25th and 6th. Most likely it is talked about that they might release, that's a very blurred image, but they might release spatial mm -hmm. computing you know, on the device because Meta has this available with Ray-Ban right now, but it's a single camera primarily just for recording actions. But if they do get a dual camera, you know, the potential here could be big. And of course, let's not forget, here's Meta talking about uh, Niantic Labs using Meta Llama. So have they maybe selected Perido to, you know, as kind of their, I don't want to always say partner, but maybe this is the solution that they're going to be looking at for uh, kind of the future of this. When, uh, if that were the case, you feel sti you still feel that over is going to provide a different kind of mapping solution for the industry as well of just in general for the, you know, kind of for the segment? Well, I mean, uh, I think that, I mean, again, the way we incentivize people uh, to actually do the maps will generate different data from theirs uh, because, right. I mean, we, we have people that are doing there with that intention. Just to give an idea, 300 square meters of, of um, that is the, the, the dimension of our location and of also of our maps, we generate around 1,000 pictures. It's two gigabytes of data for each mm -hmm. location. So it's way more uh, that basically uh, they are generating right now. Maybe, I mean, in the future, I don't know what they will do, but still they have the problem why to incentivize the people. So I think that, uh, I mean, and also the strategy in the future is actually not only to enable to use this data inside of over, but also to make this data viable as APIs to third parties that maybe mm -hmm. want to build something that is a white label. And, and also, of course, uh, on that direction, we will always respect, I mean, the ownership idea of Web3 and so on. So the, the revenues will be split uh, between us and actually the owners of these maps. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, really, I believe that there is, uh, I mean, mapping the world is a huge effort. And I believe that, uh, I mean, company, as, 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 as soon as we move in this direction, companies actually will need this data and they will use whatever source they have to get it. And so we will be a, a source through the others. We believe will be the most complete of important locations in the world. Uh, but let's see. I mean, uh, like, for example, Niantic declared uh, like two months ago that they have 100,000 maps. Now they declare they have 170,000 maps. Our estimate, they have around 120,000 usable. If you go in their website and you see VPS enable location, they are around 120,000. So we are already very close to them. And so I really believe that what we're building, it's a very, very important piece of data that would be very useful for us, but also for any company that want to build uh, AR pro products uh, or special computing products, they call it like that. I'm also kind of considering this similar to to what Matterport did for commercial real estate, because they that company went public here a couple of years ago. They were trying to do the same thing, but it, it required you know super uh, expensive investment in cameras and companies to professionally go out, much like what you know Google was trying to do with that type of uh, scenario where they were mapping insides of restaurants, etc. But we just didn't see density come mm -hmm. out. You know, there just wasn't enough of it. Exactly. So, to your point. Uh, over may have uh, maybe sol solved this solution going forward. 
All right. Well, listen, uh, Diego, it's been good chatting with you. Um, I'm going to continue to watch this because I think Over might be one of the very few projects left, at least in blockchain, that I feel has a chance to really make a dent in this area. So we're going to be watching you really closely. But thanks again for stopping in today. We appreciate it. Thanks to you. It's always a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks yeah. a lot for having me. You bet. All right. So you guys are maybe tuned into the podcast side of things. Make sure and jump over to the YouTube channel because this this particular episode is important if you don't understand spatial mapping and the future of what it's going to be because it's going to be in games, it's going to be in business. You're going to see this in use cases of all types. And understanding of this, I think, is really critical. So all you have to do, of course, is jump over to um, YouTube and just search Paul Barron Network. You'll find us over there. And of course, if you're not in the Diamond Circle, that is our private membership. So make sure and use the link down below to join that. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.